before, but like now that we're actually here, we've kind of built our foundations. Just as a reminder, we're gonna look at just overall basic muscles first, overall basic bones first, and then zoom into each area specifically. So we will spend like many weeks just on the shoulder, many weeks just on the spine, many weeks just on the legs and so forth. So when we're taking a look at these, this first look at the muscles, it's just for general location and general name. Some of you probably already know a lot of these from your workouts, um, but this is just general lay of the land. And then we're gonna zoom in like origin, insertion, action, layers, et cetera. But having said that, you can still ask questions as we go, even though this is a general intro. So starting off this big muscle here in the jaw, right at the corner of your, just in the front anterior of the corner of your jaw is your masseter. And if you open and close your jaw, you can feel it get bigger and smaller. Do feel free to ask questions as we go. This, you know, when people rub the side of the head like that, and also again, if you clench your jaw and relax your jaw, you can feel how you get a bump here. That's your temporalis. It's, you know, a fairly flat muscle, but it goes into all the fascia of the head. So we're going to do some delicious scalp massage. You guys are surprisingly no questions yet. Because you're confused? It, it, just because, like, because why? What, this. Oh, yes, it, it is a lot at first. Yeah, Jay. Just the words. Did you flip? Yeah. yeah. Huh, interesting. That's really weird because like I'm in, I think, the same one. So I'll try to see what's going on. Yep. Um, I used to have uh, this set private because uh, it's copyrighted pictures from this book and I'm trying to make it public so that you don't have to sign up and have access um yeah so that's what that's the only set out of all the sets I've made that was set that way and that's why because it used uh these pictures okay so this uh big big one on the side you know when you see this big muscle you can carefully grab it but yep Jade's grabbing, yep, yep, Sarah, you got it. That big one right there, yep, that's, and if you turn your head different directions, you can feel how certain directions make it stick out. That's your sternocleidomastoid. I'm gonna flip for the name. And again, it sounds like a long, crazy name, but uh, sterno refers to the sternum, your breastbone, because it attaches there. And then, Mastoid refers to this bump behind your ear because it's called a mastoid process. Again, when we look at the muscle step by step, we'll talk all origin, insertion, action, but just that's like where the crazy name comes from. Yes. Are there two of the same thing? Yes, excellent question. So all the muscles, yeah, are bilateral. Yep. So you got one on both sides, same name. Was that your question? Yep. So, uh huh. Great question. Exactly. So, yep, exactly. They're all two sides and except the very few that are like right in the middle, like there's just one sternalis, but all the others have a basically matching set left and right, give or take a tiny bit of anatomical variety. Pectoralis major is the big superficial muscle on your chest. And you can see on the clavicle or breastbone side and the chest bone side, it's like a big wide and then like a fan, you know, and then it goes out to the arm. So that's the superficial chest muscle. So if you, you know, push forward and pretend like you're pushing against resistance, the one on top that gets hard and sticks out, that's your pectoralis major. And there's one deep to it as well, which I wish was the picture that directly followed it, but just underneath it is pectoralis minor. We'll probably come to that later. 
trapezius, uh, I believe, is the first muscle we learn. It's the most superficial muscle on the back, and it really covers a huge area. You know, uh, it's the matching right and left side, uh, but the, you know, all the way from the, the back of your head, that occiput, running all the way here out to this tri uh, triangle on the top of your shoulder, and then all the way down to the base of your thorax. So that it, the, and, and down here, it's a pretty super fit, uh, thin muscle. But so when you feel and see like on a superhero or a gymnast or everyday humans too, but you see that big one right on top, that's trapezius. But that's just, a, that's just the su superior part of it right here. And if you look, it actually goes down here as well. But this part down here is a lot thinner and it doesn't usually stick out on people. Yes. Uh huh. Yep. Yep. And if you raise and you know elevate and depress your shoulder while you hold up on top of here, that mound that you can feel is the trapezius. And when people like who don't know massage go up to each other and squeeze each other's shoulders, right? That's mostly what they're grabbing is traps. Oh, and you know its nickname is traps. And it's, you know, it's trapezius. Latissimus dorsi, its nickname are the lats. And this is that big swimmer's muscle. I mean, swimmers are and not the only people who have big lats. Uh, gymnasts have big lats too. Um, but uh, you, I say swimmer's muscle uh, because it's a powerful extensor of the shoulder. And so when people do movements like you know, big, you know, strokes through the water, they're developing these powerful lats. And gymnasts, you know, when they do ring work and so forth, to be able to maneuver their entire bodies from those rings, you know, and where we see the lats and feel them is right here on the side. So if you kind of lean forward, anterior, so you got your pecs up front, and then if you feel that, so there's a mound up here that's your pecs. And then if you feel for the mound, I have a tender spot on mine, posterior and leaning forward, there's a big strong muscle on the side just below your armpit. Can you all feel that? Yes. I was going to ask about that because it seems like that area right there yep. is always so tender. Uh -huh. And I've experienced it with other people too, not just on myself. Uh-huh. Like my boys, if I try to rub them right there, they're always like, "Whoa, stay away." Uh -huh. What is it that makes that area so tender in there when you dig into that? Uh huh. Um, there's certain muscles that kind of uh, posturally are kind of always contracting, 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 and they can develop, um, you know, trigger points and and tender spots from that. When I see you pointing, you are pointing all the way back to the lats. Before that, there's all these serratus anterior and other, you know, reasons to be sensitive between the lats and the pecs. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely yes. It's really, I mean, even on me, it always feels kind of sore when you Yeah, yeah. And we'll learn good ways to massage that. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. uh, you bet. So if you look at this picture, um, you know, again, this darker color red is the fiber, but look at this grayish, whitish part with a little bit of pink in it. This is the muscle uh, tendon. It goes into this tendon. So the muscle attaches all the way to the iliac crest and the sacrum. So there's this big, in the middle of the back, this huge fascial sheath called the thoracolumbar aponeurosis. And anyway, that big powerful lat, you know, it can act on this arm, right, through extension, but because it also attaches on the iliac crest here, it actually is powerful enough to move someone from their hips, right? That's what the, like a gymnast on the rings or the bars is really also working, or if anybody who can do, you know, um, I'm forgetting the name of this one. I was thinking it was called monkey bars. That takes a, a lot of lat strength. Muscle ups. Muscle ups. Pull ups and muscle up. Yeah, this one. Yeah. 
I love those. Okay, quadratus lumborum is nicknamed and also the abbreviation on charts is QL. And this is, uh, on this picture, it's the one on the right. So it's a deep muscle between your lowest rib and your hips. And this one is nicknamed the hip hiker because it's really the most powerful muscle that does that hip elevation. You do not need to memorize all the movements yet. I'm just giving you a little preview to these muscles. This one, uh, let me flip, quadratus lumborum. And on your, um, on sixth edition, what page were, were we? 35, okay. Let me help you, okay, well, we're looking at, so of course the back picture, actually your book doesn't show it well on that one. What they usually do is on one side, well they do that, they do that well in the, in the gluteal area, but usually there's one side that shows the superficial muscle peeled away. Like on 36, if you look at the glutes uh, peeled away. Um, but I'm not seeing them do that well for the QL in these particular pictures. Um, we're getting to that area later. Erector spinae, people also abbreviate ESGs because it's also called erector spinae group. You might see in the name spine. So these go right next to the spine. And this picture is a little misleading, um, but <clears throat> oh, thank you for the QL on 190. Yeah. So um, the erector spinae, of course, here we're just looking at one side, but when you massage somebody, you're going to notice right from next week when we compress right to somebody's next to somebody's spine, you're going to notice these big kind of speed bumps on both sides. And that's what the ESGs really feel like, even though on this picture, they kind of look spread out and whatever. Questions so far? Deltoid is this big shoulder cap muscle. It's one of those muscles they always draw really big on superheroes. Um, <clears throat> and it goes all the way in front of the shoulder to the side of the shoulder and in the back of the shoulder. So if you feel your own, you know, and you move your shoulder forward, so you flex your shoulder, you can feel how strong and hard and sticking out the front part gets. And if you extend, you can feel how strong and hard the back section gets. But what all the sections do is if you hold the top and you abduct and then adduct, you can feel how abduction engages them all. And they're very powerful in that movement. Uh, this one, just a little preview, there's this triangle on the top of your shoulders that goes from your clavicle, which is your collarbone, and the back of your spine of your scapula. Your traps and your deltoid both share that attachment. And the reason I bring that up is that sometimes people kind of think about this just in the back, but it's going all the way from here to here to here and this trap goes down to it and the deltoid goes up to it. Yeah. You guys are so quiet. All right, so your inter and exter, external and internal intercostals, enters between and the costal refers to ribs. So these are just literally the little tiny muscles between each rib. And if you feel a rib space where there's not a lot of thick muscle, so you could feel like between two ribs on your side, or you could feel two ribs close to your sternum, over here you're going to get pecs in the way, but over here it's thinner, like closer to your sternum is thinner. 
the ribs are going to feel smooth and slippery. So kind of if you go up and down and you find smooth and slippery things, those are your ribs. And then between them, deep to them, go side to side and you feel some kind of hard or bumpy, sometimes tender. Those are your intercostals. They go between all the ribs all the way around. And as massage therapists, because of the thick muscles, there are certain ones that we can directly access and others that the kind of muscles are in the way. But these help us breathe in and breathe out. Yeah. Do you feel it like in the side on your rib? If you feel it right under your rib, that's like your diaphragm. But if you feel it like right in your rib, then yeah, that's an intercostal. Yeah. Okay, uh, abdominal muscles. <clears throat> Rectus abdominis is the one that gives you a six pack. And everybody has a six pack, right? Some of us just hide ours under fat. So everybody's got that muscle, right? Um, so that's the most superficial abdominal muscle. Right and left, it goes up and down. That's the rectus. Abdominus is abdominal. So that's our superficial ab. And the part that looks like a six pack, which you can see in the picture, is this, you know, the kind of lighter to the side is a connective tissue. And what that's doing is because it's such a long muscle spanning a really long area, it just kind of has some connect connective tissue stripes to help it be stronger as that muscle contracts. Sure, sure, you can try that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's four abdominal muscles and they come in layers. And so um, external obliques um, go on an angle as if you were putting your hands in your pockets. And they come out to the side more. So rectus abdominis is right in the middle, up and down, and then rect uh, external obliques come out to the side. And you can see that if you're looking at your textbook, um, you know, like page 35, you know, you can see that, you know, these come out pretty far laterally. Um, and so, you know, if we, we start talking about, you know, core workouts or, you know, working out your abs, you know, of course there's many different ways to do this. Um, but, you know, when you do crunches in different directions, the reason is because of the different angles of these muscles. So a straight up crunch is gonna get your rectus abdominis, but it's when you start twisting and angling that you get your internal and external obliques because they also do that twisting motion. And then internal, they're deep to the external. So the external is in the direction of hands in your pockets is the direction of the fibers. And then deep to that opposite angle is internals. So we've got our layers of external and internal wrapped all the way around to the side of our ribs. Further laterally than people often think. But if you do some twists with a crunching movement, you can feel how far, you know, these abs come. And of course, a lot of people are into working their uh, core muscles these days. And, you know, so massage therapists do sometimes get now as deep as the iliopsoas, or people say they're psoas. And so, you know, we do sometimes work these. Transverse abdominus is the deepest abdominal muscle. And the transverse refers to, you know, this horizontal direction. So this one is kind of more like packing tape. And so at the deepest layer, it's going side to side, you know, holding your organs in. So deepest one, we've got transverse abdominus and then comes internal oblique, and then comes external oblique, and then comes rectus abdominis. Questions? Yeah. 
Are you speaking specifically uh, around the organs or in general? Yeah, yeah, around the organs. Um, well, around the abdominal area, we've got those four layers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So the upper arm, uh, biceps brachii gets a lot of attention. It's the superficial one. People talk about its main action, you know, as that flexion but it also supinates. So people sometimes call this the beer drinking muscle because this is both flexion and supination. It could be any beverage. <laughs> um, all right, brachialis is the one deep to it and it um, only flexes. And the pattern of these superficial deep muscles is that the deep one is usually shorter, only crossing one joint, and the superficial one is usually longer, crossing more than one joint, um, which kind of makes sense if you think about how it could be layered and how it could attach to the muscles. Um, but so the, the deeper one tends to be more stability and just one strong motion, whereas the, the superficial one you know, can do other motions as well. People are pretty attuned to this in workouts these days, right? There's a lot of functional fitness workouts with people doing integrated movements that really work with muscles in a coordinated way instead of like, you know, used to be people would do just like one isolated movement. One of the things that's great about that is that it really works these muscles together and works the relationships of the muscles too. And you've got your stabilizing muscles and your synergist muscles and like all working together. So in this case, not just working your, you know, uh, one muscle at a time. Brachioradialis, we can see that brachial term in there again for arm. And then the radialis, you can see the, the radius term in there for the um, bone in the uh, lower arm. Oops, I didn't show you a picture. So if you turn your hand, like you're gonna shake someone's hand, like your thumb is up, brachioradialis is the one right on the top. And if you, you know, um, radially ab adduct your, um, your wrist, or in other words, deviate it so that um, you're going towards uh, your thumb up, that's going to contract your brachioradialis. All the other forearm muscles are just on the front anterior or the back, and they're separated by this brachioradialis. So it's pretty, pretty straightforward on the forearm. There's your anterior flexors, there's your posterior extensors, and then brachioradialis separating the two. Again, this is just a lay of the land. It's a lot of muscles. So if this is new territory to you, it would be normal that you can't process all that I'm saying. This is just an introduction. And for those of you that already know a lot of basic muscles names, this probably is review for you and we'll go deeper later. Triceps brachii, what do you think the, what does the prefix tri mean? Excellent, three. So the three refers to the heads, right? And in, and in biceps brachii, uh, what does bi mean? Two. And so biceps brachii has, has two heads on one side and triceps brachii has three heads. Um, the brachii, you see that brachii for like brachial, again, that refers to the arm. So this again is those general terms um, will help you determine the muscle name. So here we have in triceps brachii, um, you know, this the big powerful muscle in the back of your arm. Um, you'll notice that it's got this giant tendinous area, right? So you'll notice that even in weightlifters, like even professional bodybuilders who have giant triceps, you'll still see that like they have this flat part, right? No matter how big they get, 
they still have this flat part and you can see that you know in the shape of the muscle because they have these like feathers uh, which is called a pennate muscle and in this case a multi pennate muscle coming into that that central tendon yes have you ever um, massaged a person who is very muscular? Oh, yes. And how did you, how did you, how did you get to that massage? Um, I mean, it really depends on the person. Some people who are very muscular are also very flexible, um, and it's not that hard to get into their tissues. Some people who are very muscular have big walls of connective tissue and are harder. Um, they also like varying pressure, so, you know, big variations, but we'll teach you a lot of techniques of how to warm up the tissue and different strategies. Yeah. I, I do remember this one big football player, like a linebacker that was, was pretty tough to, to, to get through some of his connective tissue, but in, in most cases, you know, um, it, it works out all right. He, he was very happy with it, but you've probably started to notice even on the feet, right? Like everyone just kind of has a different baseline and some people are more soft and flexible and other people you'll notice this even more when you start massaging backs. Some people will have just like this giant wall of connective tissue and you're just not gonna have the same response, right? In one session as somebody who has more give. But they're often very happy, right? You're not, you're not gonna turn them into a flexible gymnast in one session. Is it, is it, um, is it the snapping uh, that is really helpful for athletes that I'm just bringing up there for them to the bars? I'm not, that's definitely one strategy, yeah. But, but there are a lot of uh, different modalities that work well for athletes. Yeah, yeah, but that that definitely some people use the ashiatsu bars to get more pressure. Yeah, as some massage therapists will get right on the table as well. I've gotten on the table for really big clients sometimes and used more of my body um, weight. Yeah, but we'll teach you the body mechanic strategies. Pectoralis minor. This one is deep to pectoralis major, um, so it's in the chest. If you feel this collarbone or clavicle. And then if you feel close to the lateral side, just a few inches from the lateral side, underneath that collarbone, and you might need to roll yourself forward to feel a round bone that's about yay big. And if you roll forward and you use a flat, like three fingers, do you feel a round bone there? It can be tender around it. Beautiful. That's your attachment. That's going to then go down to this skinny muscle with like this down to your ribs. But that one is deep to pec major. So you've got a bigger, stronger muscle. So we, we do tricks like going around pec major when we massage it. Yeah. I had a massage one time and I was like, yeah exactly and we'll definitely learn how to do that you go around pec major to get into pec minor but word of caution and we'll teach you like don't jump into this um those deeper muscles can be very 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 tender and so there's you want to you know warm up and go slowly and yeah yeah but that's that's what we do rhomboids they are generally yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, that's all right. Uh, rhomboids are situated between the shoulder blade, which is the scapula, and the spine. So this is that classic area, and of course they'd be on both sides, right? So if we drew in the other side, it would be like an evergreen coming down like that, you know, a tree coming down like that. And this is an area that a lot of clients feel sore and tight. Um, but actually, because most people are over protracted, these are actually usually stretched long rather than being 
contracted too much. So most people, their rhomboids are actually stretched long and weak, and they actually need more strengthening to be able to pull those shoulder blades back. But they still get trigger points, um, you know, being stretched long. So we will work those trigger points um, right here on the edge. Beautiful question. Yeah, it's deep to trapezius. So trapezius is the most superficial muscle in the back. And then we're going to have the, the rhomboids deep to them. Yes. So I had asked you before about in front of the steroids and how the back is kind of more curved uh -huh. now. Mm -hmm. So can you make a relationship now that we're more comfortable and how that's happening? Um, that's a very common to get hyperkyphosis and um, irrespective of steroid use. Um, that is part of this whole pattern that is so common now with cell phone use and laptop use that we off, we often call it tech neck now. Um, but, you know, people are rounded forward like this a lot. And if their posture isn't, you know, sort of pulled back and corrected, um, they, they're getting all these muscles basically short and tight and then over too much curve in their upper back, you know, and you can get that kind of, um, that kind of bump there. So is that the muscles overstretched? Yes. Uh-huh. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and basically like muscles should get to contract, relax, contract, relax. But when we're in a certain posture all the time, some of them are always contracting and some of them are being stretched and, and neither is good for blood flow um, or you know the, the functionality of the muscle. So basically you get extra connective tissue thrown down and some of the muscles get weak and some of the muscles get short and tight. And massage can do a lot to balance that out. But we end up having to work with the connective tissue as well. So we'll do a lot of myofascial relief, which is super fun. Occipital frontalis, you know, uh, is, is relatively minor, you know, but if you're gonna give somebody like a, a scalp massage, you know, we've got this thin muscle up in the forehead, you could see this lighter color here, that's just more connective tissue, and then a little bit of thin muscle right here. So you may or may not like already think about like how there's actually some muscle in your scalp, um, but a scalp massage can be very relaxing. People hold, I mean, obviously people hold a lot of tension in their necks, but what you may not be as aware of is that People hold a lot of tension in their faces as well. And all of this neck and face tension actually travels up and down these muscles in your head as well. So, you know, we'll learn massage strategies for that. This is getting a little bit deeper and, you know, we're not gonna palpate these deeper ones right away, but splenius capitis, um, if you feel that smooth bone behind your ear and then you feel right behind it. So the, the one that attaches to it in the front is that big sternocleidomastoid, but then deep to it. So angling back a little further is a deeper one. That's your splenius. And it, and it's, it could be really tender. It can even give you like headache, like pain, because it's one of the ones that can cause a headache. You guys are doing really well. This is a lot. Serratus anterior is another one that often gets exaggerated, you know, in uh, anime uh, characters or superheroes. Um, right on the side, you know, we have these relatively skinny muscles, but if you feel up and down, the smooth bumps are your ribs. But if you feel kind of Thick, rough uh, bumps with tender spots. That's your um, serratus anterior. I'll click on that again for. And so you can, and the serratus refers, that word serratus 
is like a serrated knife, like a, like a steak knife. And so you kind of get that pattern because it's attaching to all these ribs. Yeah. Yeah, it starts on the side and then it goes all the way under your scapula. So the part that we can massage and feel well is right on the side because it's behind your pec major and in front of your lats, which would be thicker and harder to feel, but it actually goes all the way to under your scapula. External obliques. Peck major. Oh, intercostals? Yes. Uh, excellent. Uh, it's superficial to intercostals. So the intercostals are really right between the ribs. So when you, those of you who eat meat, and sorry for those of you who are vegetarians, but if you eat ribs, you're eating intercostals. Mm -hmm. So it's literally the little tiny muscles between the ribs. And so they're very deep, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right so extensors of the forearm and wrist um they actually all have different names but right now we most definitely can just look at them as a group so in anatomical position right these are the ones in the back or posterior those are your extensors so the ones pulling from the back side can extend your wrist right? When they shorten, they pull back this way. They all have different names, um, but we'll try to, we'll just look at that later. I realize this is a lot. The rotator cuff, I'm sure you all have heard that term at some point because it's such a common injury. The rotator cuff is actually four different muscles. And since we start with the shoulder, these are some of the first muscles we'll get into. There's supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres major, and subscapularis. I'm gonna get a, I'm gonna get a shoulder here. So just as an introduction, not expecting you to really memorize all these bony landmarks yet. Um, and normally, I'm sorry, I, I walk around normally a lot more, but they haven't got our video equipment yet, so I'm trying to stay in this camera as well. Um, we'll have better camera systems that I can walk around like a normal teacher very shortly. They're working on it. So this is called the spine of the scapula. And if you feel, you know, you put your hand over your shoulder and you move up and down, it goes side to side and it, it sticks out. Right? So whether you have a lot of muscle or a little muscle, a lot of fat, a little fat, you can still feel this. Go up and down. And the bones, when you feel them, always feel hard and slippery. So that thing that feels hard and slippery when you go up and down is your spine or your scapula. Can y'all feel it? It might be tender because the muscles around it are pulling on it and that can make it tender. Why, if you care, your bone actually has this living tissue on it. The bone is actually completely alive. This model is very misleading, but on this is living tissue and the tendons that attach into it, the living tissue is called periosteum. And when the muscles you know, the, and the tendons weave right into it and they're pulling, 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 that can cause the soreness. And a really good example that a lot of you have probably had or experienced is shin splints. Most common in runners, you know, so that tugging, 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 tugging on the tissue can tug so much on that periosteum, it can literally rip off chunks of the bone. In runners, right? Because runners are crazy. I can say that because I'm a runner. <laughs> I can own that. Um, all right, so the reason I bring up the spine of the scapula is because of the names here. So spinatus refers to this spine. Supra, what does superior mean? 
above. So supraspinatus is above the spine. It's this beautiful muscle right here. And it goes through this tunnel, supraspinatus. So if you find that spine and then you move your fingers anterior, deep to traps right in that groove is supraspinatus. You're already better than most massage therapists, right? If you can find that. Because a lot of them hang out just on traps. And now you're learning these layers of muscles. So deep to the traps is the supraspinatus. We'll obviously spend a lot more time finding it and massaging it and all that. So infraspinatus, spinatus refers to this spine of the scapula. And inferior, what direction is that? Below, beautiful. And so infraspinatus, is in this whole area and it's a big beefy layered muscle it's a little bit harder to feel on yourself but if you can feel inferior to that spine and scapula that whole bumpy mess is your infraspinatus you're doing a great job Aries minor and subscapularis are also in this in this region but they don't have uh, that name in it so Teres minor attaches right here. And subscapularis is a little hard to picture when you're looking at these diagrams, but it's part of why we sculpt the muscles in clay. So subscapularis, sub is beneath, right? Like a submarine. And so it's beneath or deep to this spine, or sorry, this scapula. So what, I'm going to try to help you picture is that this scapula is on top of the ribs. So subscapularis is between this uh, scapula and your ribs. So it's very deep. Um, but there are ways that massage therapists can massage it. And, um, you know, when you go deeply under the side of it, you can get to it. But the whole purpose of these is that they all, regardless of where they start, right? We got one that starts up here, supraspinatus. Uh, we got one that starts here, infraspinatus. We got one that's deep to it, subscapularis. And we got one to the side of it, teres minor. But all four of them wrap around the top of the ball of the humerus. So they all act as supports. Um, and we'll talk about that way more next week. That's just a little preview. Questions? Z zoom in there um, just to see them a little bit better. And then flexors of the forearm and wrist, just like the extensors, you know, they all have their own names, but for right now, just introducing them as a group is totally fine. So in anatomical position, right, with the hand facing forward, these are all going to be on the front, anterior. And when you shorten from this distance to here, that ends up flexing your wrist. So those are all flexors of the wrist. And these have these, like we were palpating earlier today, long skinny tendons. And we'll see this right in next week's routines where we start doing some pin and stretch that because of these long tendons that take up about half to two thirds on the distal side, we're focusing on the proximal side for these flexors and extensors. So like when we grab, you know, the forearm and do some, you know, pin and stretch, we want to make sure that's on the proximal side. I just try to make applications as we go along, but we'll, we'll do that all slower in lab. So that's a preview to the upper body. Yes, of course. It froze again. Darn it. <laughs> uh, thank you for letting me know about the TV. Let me um, let me reconnect it. Yeah. Thank you. I like to move around too. I um, we'll get some better video equipment here in a 
soon. You'll be pleased to know, or some of you will be pleased to know that I am uh, insisting we get the kind that only films me because there's another one called an owl that is constantly always filming the whole class. And uh, I think that you might find that tiring. Is it refreshed? But if it doesn't, yeah, she's moving around. But if it doesn't, if it doesn't bother you, they might they might throw an owl in here just temporarily while they get the other one. It's a process. Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> also, the view it gets of you guys is teeny teeny tiny. Um, and then then it's the cool thing about it is that it has AI technology, artificial intelligence technology. So it follows the teacher and speaking, and so the teacher can move about like normal and not be stuck here to be in front of the screen. Is that for you what you wanted to see there? Mm -hmm. Okay, beautiful. So that is a preview to the upper body. Um, would you like to spend a little time with a worksheet practicing the upper body or I do the lower body and then we start breaking out into practice? Start upper body. Yeah, I'm hearing a lot of like stop here for now. So, um, Morgan, if you can, uh, did you find an upper body that was unlabeled to practice on? Or do I need to uh, upload one for you? You can type that out while I hand it out to them. So I'm going to pause. All right. So gluteus maximus, there are three gluteal muscles and the most superficial and biggest one is gluteus maximus. So, you know, immediately deep to the skin, you know, taking up a huge area is gluteus maximus. Attaching on this entire lateral border of the sacrum and all the way up and around here. So big, big attachment here with the gluteus maximus. And we can see here, you know, it goes into or attaches into this giant uh, tendon, the IT band, the big tendon on the side of your leg. Feel free to ask questions anytime. So gluteus medius is uh, often sort of nicknamed the deltoid of the shoulder because it has a similar relationship where it kind of goes from the front to the back and the side. And if you can cross over a joint from the front of it, the side of it, and the back of it, you can act on it in all motions. So like the deltoid, it can flex and extend and then also abduct. Yes, yes, it does. Similar shape, huh? So that's gluteus medius. And we should, there's one more glute. I don't know where it is. Um, I wish they were all together. I guess we'll be coming back to it. Uh, iliopsoas is often nicknamed or people often talk about psoas with a P, a silent P. It's psoas, not psoas. This is actually two muscles. So we have iliacus. I'm sorry, I pointed to the wrong one. Iliacus is the one that is in ilium. So iliacus like ilium. So that's the one in here. Whereas the longer part deep in the abdomen, this longer part is psoas. But when people say, you know, they, they want their psoas worked on, they, they really mean both. And, you know, this is a very, very deep muscle and a very vulnerable area to work. Um, this is not where we start our work, but when we have advanced palpation skills and so forth, we'll learn various safe ways to do this work. Yeah, but tons of people work on their core these days. And this is one of the core muscles we can help them with. Adductors are a whole group. They're a group of five muscles and they're the big strong muscles on the inside of your thighs. So big strong muscles in here. And they do attach all the way up to the pubic area. So we don't massage origins. 
but we do massage the belly and the insertions. So we don't do anything up high, right? But we can still reach a lot of the adductors down here. So adductors, they adduct, right? They bring the legs in, right? And so like an uh, example of an activity where, you know, the adductors would get a good workout is like horseback riding, like the squeezing motion. There's five of them and they each have a name for right now. We'll just call them the adductors. Longest brevis, et cetera. Okay, so extensor digitorum longus. Um, you know, it's an extensor. You can see that in the name. When it says digitorum, that means it attaches to the digits, you know. Um, so here we can see these long skinny tendons you know, going all the way out the toes. Um, so this is a deep muscle. This is not one we're gonna palpate or massage right away. All right, I'm gonna see if I can reshuffle the order because it could be a little more logical. Um, but soleus is the deep muscle in the calf. So, um, you know, we're gonna palpate superficially to it gastrocnemius. But on the edges, we can very much palpate soleus, which is tight on a lot of people. And you can see by this lighter, you know, grayer area that it attaches the tendon that it becomes one with is the um, calcaneus uh, Achilles, Achilles tendon. And so it shares that with gastrocnemius, um, that big, strong Achilles tendon. But it's a very strong plantar flexor, right? Just like gastrocnemia. So if you attach a muscle to the back of the calf, right, and you shorten um, from here to here, that can create, you know, this motion. So a little confusing putting him, her, them upside down, but looking at it in a less confusing direction. We go from here to here, and when we shorten, we have this strong plantar flexing. The alis anterior is, uh, this is a slightly confusing angle, but if we look at the tibia, so it's right in the title, this tibia bone and the name tibialis anterior. So, it's just right next to the tibia. You can feel on yourself, just lateral, there's a muscle right next to the, you'll feel the hard uh, bone and just next to it is tibialis anterior. And because if you shorten from here to here, this is a strong dorsiflexor. <laughs> Good job. I love that you guys are palpating, doing the movement. Yes, yes. Good observation. Um, so it actually wraps um, over, yep, <laughs> and crosses medially, which means that in addition to that dorsiflexion, it can also lift the um, foot inward up, you know, inversion. Yeah, by where it crosses over. This is our skeleton that's not balanced well, and I'm worried with this extensive TV, I should move the other skeleton over here. Okay, so this is a skinny minor muscle. Um, the thing about muscles is that they vary in how many muscle fibers they have. And the fewer muscle fibers it has, the weaker it is because each muscle fiber has a certain amount of strength. So this is a really long skinny muscle. So it doesn't do its job very strongly, um, but it crosses you know, all the way from up here and crosses over. And um, it's a very minor muscle, sartorius but it is the longest muscle in the body. So that's like a factoid you tend to see about it. 
Um, the Sartorius name somehow relates to like a, a tailor. So it, it weakly does all the muscles to cross your leg over in this position. So it can do all those actions, but just a little bit. Not very strong in any of them. Um, that's going to work out more the, the sides, the, the pulling up. Yeah. This, it, this is just not very strong. Yeah. Okay, so this is the one that uh, we just noticed in the textbook has two different names. So I think the more common name is peroneals. Um, and then your textbook changed the name on it, right? Fibularis, yeah. So you can call these peroneals or fibularis. If you call them peroneals, there's peroneal longus and brevis. Um, these are very easy to palpate on the side of the lower, lateral side of the lower leg. So if you once again feel the, the crest of your tibia, the, the bone right there, and then you go lateral to it, the one immediately lateral to it is tibialis anterior. Then if you go even more lateral, that's the peroneals or fibularis. <clears throat> Great job uh, feeling around for those. Okay, so this is the deep six rotators of the hip. You can call them the lateral hip rotators or the deep six um, hip rotators. There's actually six of them, but there's two names listed here because those are the two that are easiest to palpate that massage therapists work with really frequently. And piriformis, you're gonna work with a lot. We will even start working with it next week in our compression routine. And when people get sciatica, sometimes they have a true sciatica, which could be a compression of the sciatic nerve even higher up. But what a lot of people actually have is piriformis syndrome, where this muscle is actually compressing the nerve. And that's the type that massage therapists can help quite a bit with. So in this picture, uh, deep in the gluteal area, right in here, these are all deep to you know gluteus maximus, but we'll learn some palpation tricks. Um, you kind of always need some palpation tricks or precision palpation with the deeper muscles. We're not starting right there as far as our deep dive. This is a little bit more advanced. There's our other adductors. You know, we're just learning them as a group right now. I lied, that one's called out. There's gracilis. So gracilis is one of the adductors. There's five adductors and it's the long medial one. But we'll learn them in detail later. I'll shuffle the, the deck order around later so when you study, it's more logical. Um, so we've already introduced this one a little bit even in our foot massage, but the superficial muscle in the lower leg is called gastrocnemius. And you can see in this picture, it has two heads. So on the distal side of this muscle, right, we can see these muscle bellies and there's two of them. And uh, I'm sorry if I said distal, the proximal side. And on the distal side, you know, we can see that it weaves into this very strong Achilles tendon, like soleus, which is the one that's deep to it. This is a muscle, right, that is very strong and prominent and visible on many different types of athletes. You know, you'll see it very strong in bicyclists and runners and, and gymnasts and, you know, um, everyday people. Uh, the gastrocnemius gets quite tight as well. Um, so very easy to palpate, very important to massage. Uh, and you can see that this Achilles tendon, right, as we started to look at even in foot massage, right, goes right into the calcaneus or the heel. You guys are so quiet. Any questions? Yeah. Uh huh. Yep. 
Uh huh. Yep. Yep. It feels good on this one to get right in between the heads and in our compression routine next week. Um, you'll also see we'll work both sides of it and different ways, you know, to work with it. And Darlene Sluter's video foot massage, uh, she does an excellent job when the client is supine of really working through is so delicious. It's one of my favorite kinds of work in the world. Um, I will work with them out until my spring because I like taking the long forearms on it. Oh, yeah, that's nice too. That's the one you don't want to work to the top of it. Um, we are more careful, right? Just right in the popliteal crease. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great, great questions and comments. Everybody, thanks for your contributions. Uh, I, I'll, I hope. Well, we're recording. I, I don't know. Um, tensor fascia latte or tensor fascia latte. This is a beautiful muscle. People abbreviate it TFL. This is a beautiful muscle as massage therapist to massage because nine out of 10 massage therapists never touch it, maybe even more than that. So it's one of those muscles that can set your work apart because if you understand where it is and how to work it, that's one of those muscles that other clients will be like, oh my God, I get massages all the time and I've never had that before. And those are awesome things that just really make your work different and also more effective, right? Because it's something nobody's addressed. So this one is just really far anterior on the iliac crest. And so if you feel at the front of your hip bones, there's this very prominent, and you can follow the top of your hip bone all the way to this bump in the front right? And if you go just to the side of it, it's about two, three fingers width, and it's, it's right behind that. Um, and of course, we'll spend more time in massage lab with it, but just as a starting point. Um, <clears throat> that one also goes into this wonderful, strong IT band. So really kind of interesting right like sometimes like a ton of people have tight it bands right they can have a whole um it band syndrome lots of athletes right their it band gets too tight and a lot of times people don't think about that with these tendons they're being pulled on by the muscles right so we need to work the muscles that are pulling on them so in this case we're going to release gluteus maximus and TFL. And then we're also going to release the tissue that got adhered to it. That's just a preview, but that's going to be the kind of thing that makes your work effective and awesome. All right, our hamstrings. So there's three hamstrings, semi membranosus tendinosus and biceps femoris. We'll look at the details later. This picture on the left should not be there. That's the quads. Uh, I will fix that. Uh, this is the ones we're looking at here on the right. So a lot of you probably have heard of the general group. Um, they're the three muscles in the posterior thigh. And they all attach to this big bone here called the ischial tuberosity, which is nicknamed your sitz bone. Because if you sit with good posture, you're sitting on this bone. A lot of us lean forward or back or slouch. But if you sit up and you put like your fist uh, or your hand under your butt, you should feel this bone and all your hamstrings attached there. So again, and this is why we preview all of the muscles as early as next week in our compression routine, we're going to be massaging this specifically to release all the hamstrings. Mm -hmm. And it's very effective. That's right it's lower than the business. <laughs> yep, there's the, the butt cheek and it's at the base of the butt cheek. Mm -hmm. And it's not really in you know the genitals as much as it might appear with this model. Mm -hmm. Yep, you're just right and it's a good, 
big strong area, right? It usually takes like an elbow. Yep. Yes. I haven't seen stick hitting there. <laughs> That's interesting. Huh, interesting. Interesting. I don't know that one. Yeah, I'd be curious to learn more about that. <laughs> Oh, you got smacked right there. Um, the quads uh, or quadriceps group, quad of course means four, and the big, you know, strong muscles on the front of your thigh, right? This is your quads. Um, and rectus femoris, and then the other three have vastus in their lane name. Medialis would be on the medial side. Lateralis would be on the lateral side, and intermedius is the deep one. But something I want to point out right from the beginning, because we're going to palpate this and massage this next week, is that a lot of people just think about the quads right here, right? But vastus lateralis also takes up the entire lateral side. So you've got the IT band superficial to it. But this whole big muscular side is also vastus lateralis. So we're gonna fully massage that, right? And not neglect it. Um, people who have very muscle, you know, well-developed muscles with less body fat, all kinds of athletes, you know, you can see that well-developed teardrop, right? That's your vastus medialis when you see that teardrop. Um, and then we've got our rectus femoris is the one that runs up and down the middle, which is the only one that crosses the hip joint. So all the others just cross the knee joint. And then we've got the lateral one. So if they all cross the front of the knee, if we shorten and pull, if I pull right here, what motion can I do? Beautiful. Yes, can you guys visualize that? Beautiful, you guys are learning. You are learning. The learning is on fire in here. Nice work. You just studied 16 terms. All right. So you guys have the handouts. 